Hey everybody, it's Mike. Want to answer the question or explore the question, what is love bombing? You've probably heard that term before. She loved bombed me, he loved bombed me. What is love bombing? Well, you've heard phrases like idealization, you've heard of splitting, You've heard of love bombing. Um, it's interesting that we focus on, we have like a special word for idealization, which we call love bombing. But we don't have a special word for when they discard you, when they ghost you, when they break up with you, when they split on you. Isn't that interesting? Love bombing. Um, because, you know, I think probably because of our emotional experience. So bear in mind, if you are somebody who is in a relationship or has been in a relationship with a borderline, by definition, you are codependent. You don't have to like that. I honestly don't care if you do or not. My job is to share what has worked for me and what I think is uh, helpful for others. If you can figure out something different than me, go right ahead. Plenty of other channels to go to. I'm definitely not the only person talking about this. And let me just say for the record, I am not a psychologist. I am not a psychiatrist. I am not an expert in borderline personality disorder. I am somebody who lived through it. And so uh, I understand from an experiential point of view what it's like. So for those of you who are borderlines, welcome to the channel. Uh, bear in mind, I don't know what you go through. I, just, I do my best to try and figure it out. And I think I've like a, like a borderline, I have pretty good uh, empathic, intuitive skills, but I can't say that I know for a fact. I think probably the only person who could really know for a fact and be able to talk about it is somebody who truly is a recovered borderline who can go back and say, here's what was going on with me in that moment. All right, once again, I'm going off trail here. So what is love bombing? Love bombing is when they are idealizing you. Now, I can't speak for everybody else. I know what I've heard, I know what I've read, and I know what I experienced. And of course, all, not all borderlines are the same and not all relationships with borderlines are the same. You all know that. I think that I was lucky enough that I had a textbook, extreme, quiet, borderline. Um, you know, which, anyway, you guys know how incredibly, uh, you know, confusing it is because they come across so put together and then you find out later that they're not. Any case, I digest. What is love bombing? Love bombing is when they are idealizing you. And I would say from my experience that the most intense love bombing is going to be in the very beginning. Because in the very beginning, again, you are a codependent. What does that mean? That means that you have something that they relate to. They have emptiness inside of them, like love. Like, you know, they're like, if you really want to study the most vulnerable needs of being loved, um, you know, I think the thing to do would be to climb inside of a borderline at the time when the trauma did whatever it did to them. Something happened between infancy and two years of age where something broke in them and then they started to split. As I understand it, that's how it, it works. Somewhere around two years old, they start splitting. And, um, you know, that really, that's what's happening. That's the place they're coming from. So if you can understand or try to understand Try to wrap your head around what it must be like to be that infant or that two-year-old who finally comes to the realization that they're never, ever going to be loved, that they're always going to be rejected. And so they must be stuck in this constant loop of absolute horrific need for love and approval and, you know, all of that. So what would that look like? If you were to go back to that point in time when that, let's say, assuming I'm right, I could be wrong, but let's just say for argument's sake that things are building up in this infant who's not getting their needs met and then it comes to this crescendo where 
if they don't get all the love they've never gotten and they don't get it right now, the whole world comes apart and, you know, imagine how much love they would need. So since everything is projection in the world, this is me talking now, my philosophy, um, we project our internal uh, experience onto the world around us. You know, the borderline is the master of projection of their internal reality. So imagine what that must feel like, you know, and uh, if you're not clear, look at the little, uh, the little crying baby here in the corner. That's why I picked that as my, as my logo. By the way, if you, if you want to uh, subscribe, you got to smash that little baby in the face. <laughs> Go ahead and smash on that little baby right there and then you can subscribe. I picked that for that reason. It's because it's what both the borderline and the borderline partner, that's, that's the core feeling. That's what brings them together is that, that absolute utter cry for love. I mean, borderlines, those of you around here, I am not your enemy. I am not here to put you down. You know, I think I can speak for pretty much all of the, the codependents here that if there is anybody in the world, if, if I could snap my fingers and take out all of the pain of all of the borderlines in all of the world, I would do it. I would snap my fingers and do it because I think I have an understanding of what, how, how horrific it must be to live in that all the time. So that's what love bombing is. They are giving to you what that little infant was crying out for that never got. So the thing that's so confusing is that when somebody, you know, a non-borderline love bombs you like that, it's an indication of how they're going to be going forward. That's why it's so amazing because you're like, oh my God, I'm going to have this for the rest of my life. But what ends up happening is I understand it is that there's this repetitive compulsion that then gets hardwired into them. And so if you know anything about repetitive compulsion, it's like, you know, a training a dog. You know, a dog does things for a treat. So in some weird, sick, twisted way, if I'm understanding it right, they get this weird um, internal reward for every time they split. So that's why you can't, you can't avoid it. It's going to happen because they're looking for that reward. If, if my thought process is accurate here, which I, you know, I'm just musing here, I could be totally wrong. The whole point is helping me thinking about it like this helps me to distance, repair myself, create boundaries and have compassion. And as I've said, you know, the border, the, excuse me, the, the codependents who feel the need to blame the borderline and see them as consciously knowing what they're doing to you, you're still in denial. Because if somebody consciously knows that they're hurting you, that means they can consciously stop and then repair the damage, which means on an unconscious level, even though you, I, hate, I hate her, I hate him, they did this, they did that, they're horrible, they're evil, that really means is that you're still waiting for them to turn around and go, I'm so sorry I did that to you, I really love you, here, let me fix it. it means that if, if they truly understood what they did, what you're saying is you know that if they wanted to, they could love you the way you need. But what if they can't? What if they're broken? What if they're so broken that, uh, that they desperately do want to love you, but that those wires were never created? There's just a bunch of sparks going off in their brain and in their heart. So imagine that. Imagine how horrific it would be if you're a codependent. It's easy for you to do that because you've done it this whole time. You know how much pain they're in. You probably know how much pain they're in more than they do because they can't face it. But you look at it. You see it. You go there. You dive deep into it. And you think by diving deep into that pain, you can then pull them out of it because you're the one who under understands. But there is a compulsion repetitive compulsion payoff for them to split on you. So what they're doing when they're love bombing you is they are trying to fix the need within themselves through projection. If you understand unconscious project, projection or transference, 
forgive me, I'm not a psychologist, you get the idea. The need to be loved is, is inside of them. They're seeking for it. They see in you that you have that same need. They dump all of that onto you in a way that no other being could because they're borderline. And because you have that need, you soak it all up. The cotton candy, you eat it. There's no nutrition there, but you, you it's so sweet and tasty and so so satisfying but addicting and then what ends up happening is that at some point that initial love bomb which is going to be their idealization you're going to be perfect there's going to come a time in the beginning where you really are absolutely perfect to them that's because they're looking for that just like a little baby a little baby is looking for mommy's perfect love and in an under you know in a normal situation when mommy who does actually love the baby and the baby's that small mommy is perfect and satisfies that need they never got that so they're trying to get that experience through you and because it's a projection they're projecting onto you what they want from you which does if you're a good codependent boy that kicks into that and you are going to be that and you just take all of your boundaries, throw them all away, and you are 100% there with them. Now, because they, their idealization of you, the perf that initial perfection of you is in fact totally impossible and is not realistic, they are projecting onto you something that doesn't exist. You know, you're a human being, but they're projecting onto you a candy cane with, you know, uh, you know, whatever their fantasy is, they're not seeing you. They, they're not seeing you when they discard you. They're not seeing you when they're idealizing you. You don't know that. You think, oh my God, somebody really sees me for who I really am. Oh my God, somebody really sees how much I love and oh, they appreciate it. Oh. No, they don't see that. They don't see you at all. And then what ends up happening is that because it is impossible, because the idealization they have of you is impossible, because the only way that idealization would be mirrored back to them in the way they need would have been when they were a year old or two years old or whenever it was, and when mommy just does what mommies are supposed to do, then they would have had that hyperinflated experience of perfect love that mommy gives to them. And by the way, nobody can love like a mother anyway. There's no such thing as unconditional love except, you know, a healthy mother. Nobody in the world can do it. So for them to expect that of you, you are going to fail big time. But because they're borderline, you don't have to fail big time. You just have to fail a little bit. Now, maybe you do actually fail. Maybe you burp or fart in front of them. Maybe you are in a bad mood. Maybe you didn't say the right thing, maybe you actually did do something narcissistic, which they responded to, that is a possibility, but it's equally possible that you did absolutely nothing. And what ends up happening, because splitting is something that happens automatically within them, I think, I'm assuming that when it gets to the point where the idealization actually starts to go deep into that true intimacy need and starts to create a real intimacy, that kickstarts the need to split. So it'll be something where you don't live up to that perfect idealization. And in my experience, they never recover from that. And I'm looking back at, um, you know, when I was with my borderline, holy crap, I think about it. You know, I, I did such a good job at just denying and deflecting to myself and making excuses. And, you know, the first time that it happened, you know, the first time that she micro split on me, I mean, there was a big part of me that was going, this isn't something that I think I want to be a part of. This sounds like a lot of work. This doesn't sound like fun at all. She's, you know, this isn't, I gave her the benefit of the doubt. She caught herself. She wanted to talk about it. And I came up with the, oh, I really didn't mean that. And I went overboard because on an unconscious level, I must have known that I was going to lose her. I went overboard on, you know, taking responsibility and, and letting it be all my fault and not just saying, you really didn't need to take that personally. 
In fact, I'll tell you exactly one of the ones that, that I think was one of the first micro splits that she fixed because she was still in an overall phase of idealization. So if you haven't heard me say it, I believe that they have a, a first idealization, which is an overall idealization, which is can last for a long period of time. Within that, they will have micro splits. They split all the time. But because they're in this huge first uh, overall idealization, they catch themselves and they do things that all the rest of us do when we, because, you know, this is something we all do. Somebody farts, somebody has bad breath, somebody says something, something's not perfect, and we go, mm, uh, mm, but we get over it. We talk ourselves through it, or if they do something, hey, you stepped on my toe, and they apologize in the right way, and we move on. You know, we're, we all do it. They just do it on such an extreme level because they're infants. They feel it as intensely as an infant. So um, what, had, what had happened, bear in mind the whole thing. I had driven three and a half hours to go visit her. And I was going to go do some surfing. I'm a surfer. So I, I wanted to go do some surfing down on her beaches. And that was part of it. We were going to hang out and spend a few days together. And I would sleep there. And then I would go surfing for a day. And I, so I brought my surfboard. Now, I had a car, you know, and I had to lay down the seats on the passenger side. And um, so I could put my surfboard in there. I got there. I unloaded my surfboard and blah, blah, blah. And um, I had a bunch of stuff in the, I, I can't remember exactly what, but I, I had a bunch of things in the front seat, something like that. And it would have been a huge pain in the ass. And we needed to get in the car and go somewhere, you know, get in the car for like five minutes and go somewhere. And um, she, so she had to sit like right behind me. I think I had my surfboard and everything in there. I think that's what it was. So the only place for her to sit, unless I took 20 minutes to unload everything, was the seat right behind me. And I'm thinking, not a big deal, right? We're just going to get in the car. At this point, I'm being love bombed and I'm seeing her as the most loving, accepting, conscious person in the world. And so she's not going to react like other women have and say, what are you doing? I'm not going to sit in the back. And I'm expecting her to be like she's been. And she's going to go, oh, cool. I'll sit in the back and rub your neck or I'll sit in the back and we'll play a game. I'm expecting her to be like that. No. I say, can you sit in the back? She sits in the back. <laughs> About 10 seconds go by and I'm driving down the road and she says, I have to stop. I have to stop. I have to get out. I have to get out. We have to stop. And get out. And she starts going, why did you put me in the back? I'm having, I'm reacting. I'm reacting really hard right now. Why did you put me in the back? And this is the, and that, so I was like, what was there to say? I mean, I don't know what to tell you. My surfboard's over there, my stuff. I mean, I can move it if you want, but I figured that we were just going to be gone for a few minutes. I mean, is I didn't mean anything by it. It was nothing personal. I mean, I swear to you, blah, blah, blah. And then she goes, okay, well, could you move it? And so I move it. And then again, we drive and she says, okay, I have to stop. I have to stop. We have to stop and we pull over and she has to talk about it again. And why was this and why is that? And what did you mean? And what were you thinking and all that? And so she, she talks herself in and she goes, okay, all right. Okay, you didn't mean anything by that. You weren't saying, okay, so you weren't. But it didn't really hold. I could feel that she was doing her best to convince herself that I really hadn't totally destroyed her and done the absolute worst possible thing anybody's ever done. I could see her just trying to convince herself that it was all okay. She never really recovered from that. So there's like this, the love bombing here, right? And then there's the first devaluation, boom. Maybe the first devaluation, boom, all the way to the bottom. But they talk themselves back up, but it never really gets to where it was. You're never gonna, you're never gonna be perfect again. It's never gonna happen. Each time that you they micro split on you, you fall further and further down until finally there's the final split where you are just like all the rest of them. You're you're just like that guy. And you know what she said to me was towards the end was you know, and I keep seeing my father in you, and I, I shouldn't say that to you, but, you know, you know, I don't like my father and what my father did, and you, you remind me of my father, and, and it's just, I knew it was over. <laughs> I knew that that, you know, once she had said that, I reminded her of her father, and I had heard nothing but horrible things about her father. And I remember thinking, 
how did I get from being you're the best because you do all the good things, quote, to you remind me of my father. And now bear in mind when she's saying to me, I remind her of her father, she's trying to get herself back. And that was one of the things that was confusing because I saw her doing what the rest of us do. Even some of us who have dysfunctional issues, you know, we, we devalue people and we get, you know, um, we get disappointed with people and all that, but we, you know, we talk ourselves back into it. We have this ability to talk ourselves back to getting them to, you know, to be really great people again. Um, and we learn to love. We, we learn to find the real person in there that wasn't our fantasy, our projection. By the way, the first nine months of any relationship is projection. Transfer is projection. Um, even when we get to that nine month uh, level and we make the decision to stay in them, we find ways to then love the things that are imperfect about them. And that's what makes them cute. That's what makes them them. That's what makes, you know, we learn to really love in a mature way. They never know how to do that, borderlines. So once you are dis, dis uh, once, you're, once you're devalued that first time, and then they bring you back up, they don't have the ability. They run out of energy. I also saw her literally run out of energy. She had hyped herself up to believe that I was going to be the one that was going to save her and be the, you know, we were going to sail off into the sunset together. And I could see that every time that that she split on me and devalued me and came back, each time was a little less. So I'm seeing uh, comments from people who are, you know, with their spouse or, you know, for X amount of years. And, you know, my wife or my husband doesn't want to have sex with, it, with me anymore. The thought of being sexual with me is disgusting to them. What that means is that they no longer have any energy to bring back, you know, the, the idealization. So while when you hear about, at least based on my experience, when I hear the psychologists talk about splitting, they go from loving you to hating you, it makes it sound like that they go to, they go from loving you to hating you, loving you to hating you, loving you to hating you. And in my experience, that's really not what happens. It's loving you, hating you, loving you, hating you, loving you, hating you. Loving you, hating you, hating you, hating you, hating you, hating you. <laughs> they never really recover. So this is, as I understand it, this is an impulse. This is a, um, a compulsion and a repetitive uh, compulsion and impulse within them that they created, I think, when they snapped, when it just snapped in them, when they were just really, really tiny. It just snapped in them, and they don't know. They just don't have... You know, that's that's why it's so important for parents to do the right thing. Be good parents because they literally empower their kids to be able to respond to the normal negative things of life. And so because they have a repetitive compulsion, which means that even though it's painful for them, there is um, some kind of probably chemical um, payoff every time that they devalue you. There must be some chemical payoff uh, because that's really the only experience they have. They're only having an internal experience and the positive and the negative is all happening inside of them. It's got very little to do with you. Uh, you know, this is going to happen no matter what you do. And I think what's really important to understand is there really is the the, the thought that you have, the the... Uh, the fantasy that you have that when they were love bombing you, it was because of something that you did. That fantasy keeps us going because, you know, even though they're, you know, devaluing us and discarding us and hoovering us back and all that, there's still this delusion we have that we can get them back to where they were. They just need to see us for who we truly are, or, or I need to fix that, or whatever it is you think it is. But if you understand that it never was like that to begin with, then the, the, the idealization had nothing to do with you. It's easy, you know, it's, it, it makes us feel better to say when they discard you, when they devalue you, um, it has nothing to do with you. And that's true. 
we need to we need to realize that when they when you said, um, gosh, I think it's 1030. And then what do you mean it's 1030? You mean you want me to leave? Well, why do you, I can't believe you would do that. And you're like, no, I was trying to say what was on TV right now. Oh, I know. Oh, I, I remember this one. Oh, I know what you mean by that. I know exactly what you're thinking. Well, that was happening in reverse when they were love bombing you. You're the best person because you truly see me and you truly love me and you do the best things and nobody's ever was just as irrational and um, based on as much um, non-reality as their uh, dumping you is. If you can accept that, especially after the fact, uh, well, maybe in the middle of it too, because then you can go, oh, I might as well just stop trying because it is impossible. It's impossible for them to, to attach to you and to love to you. What, it is, what you can expect is that they will go for the only, you know, probably one of the many internal chemical impulse, um, you know, uh, rewards that they get is they get a reward when they devalue you. And that's all that they have. And that is very sad and it's very horrible. And, uh, you know, I have nothing but compassion for them. And I understand to the best that I can. I understand. Uh, but it's also really helpful for me to realize that, yeah, the love bombing wasn't love and it's not leading towards love. In fact, it's if it's this repetitive love, hate, love, hate, then the love, the loving you is actually setting them up to then devalue you. And, and this will mirror a lot of people's comments and experiences where they they believe. And I can understand this as well because I felt this that they are love bombing you to set you up so that they can then plan to demolish you and discard you. It would certainly feel like that, wouldn't it? And it certainly would look like that. And that certainly is what's happening, but it's all happening within them. They're love bombing you and they're setting themselves up for the, the chemical payoff of, you know, idealizing you. And then when that reaches its crescendo, then they're going to look for the chemical uh, the chemical payoff of going to the bottom and being angry with you. Listen, anger uh, and hate and disgust and all of those feelings have are survival mechanisms that under normal circumstances do give you, you know, those dopamine responses in your brain because they're there to help you in real situations when you really do need to have boundaries and to reject a danger. But since they are, they have a mental illness, and you know, forgive the word, because in this instance they're insane, they're not seeing reality for what it is. That uh, protective mental uh, impulse is is you know they're going to have that same payoff that we get when you know you find out that your boss is stealing from you and you decide, well, fuck him, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to go take him to court. That same payoff that we get on an emotional level, they get when they discard you and devalue you and split on you for absolutely nothing. And you can understand that that's a defense mechanism wired into human beings. So imagine here's the whole human brain and there's all this stuff that's missing. So it's just these two things of splitting, love and hate. That's all they got. It's, it's insane of you, it's irrational of you to expect that you're going to be able to get them to respond normally. And it's, it's only insane because you don't realize the person you're with has a mental illness. It's not insane to expect that of other people who have other emotional issues who maybe overreact and get their feelings hurt. It's not insane to think that you can have those kinds of discussions and have those kinds of strategies with other people who can then deal with it and work with it because they have all the other things and all the other, you know, wires are connected. Maybe they're not as connected as strongly as a super healthy person, but they're still connected. In the borderline, we're talking about a, a personality that's 
just being created and it stops in terms of intimate connections, in terms of attachment, in terms of love, uh, in terms of trust on an emotional level. You're talking about, um, you know, imagine anything, some making a car and, you know, everything's there. The wheels are there. The hood is there. You know, the radio works. Um, you know, the trunk opens, everything is there. And maybe the engine is there, but there's no transmission. There's no transmission drive or whatever the hell it is that connects the gas pedal to the back wheels that makes the back wheels turn or the front wheels if it's front wheel drive. I'm not a mechanic, obviously, but you get what I'm saying. Everything else is there. You can step on the gas and hear it rev, but the car won't go. They're stepping on their gas and the car won't go. And it's insane of you to sit in that car fiddling with the radio and fiddling with the back seat and fiddling with the mirror and maybe pounding on this, trying to get the car to move. It won't move. There's no transmission. There's just an engine and that's it. Get what I'm saying? Okay, I'm done with the similes and metaphors for the time being. So I don't know what I was trying to say. I was trying to talk about love bombing and what it is. So anyway, there it is. Uh, as I said, if you like this channel, uh, smash the baby in the face. <laughs> Click on the baby's head <laughs> and subscribe. All right, talk to you guys later.